So I think I'm probably the only person today speaking who works for an organisation that was deliberately set up to be a legacy. But before I get to that, I'd like to take you back about 230 years. This is just up the river. This is um, Wylam. And around that sort of time, uh, a boy was born into a family with no history of, of education. Um, as he grew up, he followed his father into a fairly sort of menial job. He was helping uh, maintain the really crude steam engine that pumped water out of the local mine. And he used his first wages to put himself through evening classes. And despite being illiterate till the age of 18, this boy went on to create some of the innovations that shaped the modern world. So he made it safer for miners working underground. He created the first modern, or fir first comprehensive usable steam engine. He set some standards that are still used today all around the world. His name was George Stevenson, and I'm sure most of you have heard of him. But he's a really good example of the, of, well, if him, then potentially anybody. And I think he captures something that was a legacy of the time he was born in. He was born around sort of the end of what we refer to now as the Age of Enlightenment. And one of their strongest legacies is a thing that we call um, sort of the, the scientific worldview. It's the idea that the world is intelligible. The world is there to be understood. And that's been handed down to us ever since. And the organization I work for is one of the um, inheritors of that. And I think we saw one of the talks earlier today. This isn't to say that understanding the world is easy or doesn't require lots of hard work, but it's there waiting to be grasped. So think back to when you were at school. The thing about school is it's a really good system for delivering lots of information. How many of you remember having to try and cram for exams or trying to remember sort of lots and lots of facts? And probably the harder question is, how many of you still remember most of that? <laughs> but that's, uh, it's still sort of one of the primary drivers of school. It's not the only driver of school. School does lots of things. Um, but it's particularly how we assess the impact of school. That's how we measure um, its effectiveness. And I work in something that sits alongside school, parallel to it. Sometimes we talk about informal science learning, sometimes we talk about science communication. But I think we, we look at our origins and we, we sort of trace ourselves back to um, probably the sort of 18th, 19th century. Um, and really the first sort of modern form of, of science communication was the idea of the public lecture. Um, we've got a picture here of Michael Faraday giving one of his uh, Christmas lectures, which still continue to this day. And they really combined information, uh, a bit of inspiration, and just a dash of showbiz to keep things going. And everything we've been working on is sort of follows on from that. Later in the 19th century, you had the world's great science museum started to appear, including the one in London where I used to work. Uh, and by the 1930s, they'd moved on from just uh, displaying the works of industry, the, sort of the products, the things that, um, that made the empire great, to having forms of interaction, things, demonstrations, working models, things to draw children in and to make the experience much more educational. Our field took another leap forward in the 1960s. And there's it, something that happened in a number of places, but the most famous example was what happened in San Francisco when uh, an, a physicist who had been involved in the Manhattan Project, uh, a guy called Frank Oppenheimer, um, the younger brother of Robert who led the program, um, who had, was emerging out of exile. He'd sort of flirted with left-wing politics after the uh, Second World War, which really wasn't the thing to do in the States at the time, and had, had sort of hidden away in the Midwest as a, a school science teacher for a, about a decade came back to uh, San Francisco in the early 60s, started hanging out with some quite interesting characters, artists, got involved in, in the counterculture. And in 1969 opened uh, an institution, in, well, institutions overstating it a bit then, opened a, a building, a, a, a building that had been a World's Fair venue and had sat empty for 
30 years and created something that is probably exactly what you would expect to get if you put some scientists, some teachers, some artists, some hippies and beatniks of all sorts in one place. And this is called the Exploratorium. And this is really the first modern science centre, as my profession understands it. And to this day, it's still regarded as my field's R&D department. They still do amazing, creative, spectacular things. But this movement's inspired uh, imitators all around the world. By the 1980s, um, they've started to come into the UK. There's a bit of an argument over which was the first UK science centre. It was probably either Bristol or, or a small one in Nottingham, or maybe the one in Cardiff. But they all, 1984 was the year, it seems. Move forward a bit further again. In the 1990s, uh, John Major's government launched the National Lottery. And the idea behind that was this was a way of raising money for the things that were a bit outside ordinary government expenditure. That was the original idea. And one of those lottery good causes was going to be the Millennium Commission. It was going to, you know, the UK was going to make a really big deal out of celebrating a changing calendar and a, a new naught arriving. Sorry, I shouldn't be so cynical. Um, <laughs> So the most famous part of that was the Millennium Dome, um, and this was a picture taken in 2000, so it was the Millennium Dome and not the O2 arena. Um, but actually, more money was spent outside of London celebrating the Millennium, um, and ranging from things starting with village halls all over the country to much larger buildings, um, which became known as the Landmark Millennium Projects. Some of these are, are well known, well beyond their own cities. But the idea of this sort of boom in public architecture was to create landmarks that would last a long time and would really sort of lay a marker for, for how we wanted um, the new century and the new millennium uh, to move forward. One of the issues with that was, is that they were landmark buildings and so the building was the thing. Um, and some of them have been spectacularly successful like the Eden Project. Um, most people have heard of it, and most people get what it's for. But quite a lot of them were also science centres. So, this is my office. Um, about uh, half a dozen or more science centres were planned as landmark projects. Um, and they uh, created, they appeared, they landed in, in, their, in their cities, sort of appearing to be fully formed organisations, big shiny building, often having quite shiny, spectacular, um, glossy but shallow exhibitions. The problem was is that they have the appearance of being fully formed institutions, but actually they're tiny startup organisations wearing the clothes of a big institution. We've now gone decade and a half nearly since then, and it's interesting to take a step back and look at what we've done over that time. So we're not a startup anymore. Have we actually lived up to the legacy that was intended from this? Well, the first thing is we've survived. We're still here. And this is particularly significant, I think, for the science centres because um, not being museums, not being galleries, not falling into any sort of traditional category, we generally don't receive any regular public money. So I'm very grateful to the founders of my organisation uh, because this site um, pays for itself. Uh, we're the landlord of more space than we occupy, and so our tenants, including Newcastle University, thank you very much, uh, the NHS, right down to some bars and nightclubs, are financing the day-to-day the -day operation of, of public exhibitions and education for schools. So we've survived. We've also evolved. So I, talk, I'm sort of, I was a bit glib at the beginning talking about shiny, shallow exhibitions, but I think that was true. Um, the main achievement in 2000 was actually happening, getting the building built. Um, there were very few people on the project team who were focused on what was inside it. Um, scroll forward. 14 years, we have quite a big team of people who are responsible for researching and developing the contents of the building. 
um, we also have developed and changed the way, the form of what we do. So we don't necessarily have lots of videos and screens anymore. We have activities that hold your attention for much longer and much more deeply. Uh, and I can bore you at great length about the research that underpins them, but not today. And th that links into the third part, which is that we've engaged with people. We've engaged with the research community. So uh, the scientists whose work we're showcasing, um, whose legacy we're wanting to pass on to other people. We've engaged with the researchers whose work informs us and tells us how our medium works. So we spend a lot of time talking to psychologists and learning researchers. Um, we also have had nearly three million people through our doors, so we've got a much better idea of, of what real people are like. Um, in 2000, we had no idea whether anybody was going to come on the first day. They did, thank goodness, but um, we didn't know exactly who those people would be. Um, we have a much better idea now of who, who's coming, who's not coming, and who we would like to bring into the fold in future. We're also plugged into an international network we're one of, the estimate at the moment is somewhere between two and a half and 3,000 science centres around the world. It's a bit difficult to keep track of at the moment because in Asia, they're being built at the rate of, I don't know, half a dozen a year. Um, and a couple of years ago, it was even more. I think in 2008, nine, another 200 science centres appeared around the Pacific Rim. So it's, um, it's a bit <coughs> difficult to keep track of. So at the beginning, I talked about this idea of the legacy of the Enlightenment, the idea that uh, the, the world is intelligible. And I'd argue that science centres have inherited that mantle along with other people, and that our duty is to pass on this idea, this belief, to future generations. But we live in an internet age. Access to information isn't scarce in the way it once was. Uh, Children growing up in any background don't have to wait till they're earning money to save up for uh, evening classes. So our, our value is something different. What we try to do is create a social learning experience where families and friends can come together and play and interact and experiment together and learn from each other as much as they learn from us. We also help people and support their developing sense of identifying with science, as a, believing that they are capable of being a scientist or at the very least they're capable of understanding it. The world is intelligible to them, not just to other people in an ivory tower. So this picture captures something I think is really precious. This is a child who came to one of our science festivals, I'm sorry, to a maker fair a couple of years ago. And this is an installation created by an artist from New York um, that reacts to um, people, your pulse. And he's absolutely fascinated and engrossed. I don't know a huge amount about him, but what I do know is that on that day, he was surrounded by a few thousand other people who were all equally engrossed and fascinated and drawn into what they were doing. So for him, right there, at that moment, that's normal. That being completely fascinated and being drawn into something and being completely engrossed by it is what you do. It's part of normal life. And I had to wonder, what's he going to be doing in 30 years' time? Now, could he be a future Stevenson? And then if you think about how many science centres there are around the world, that's happening millions of, hundreds of millions of times every year. So what sort of world might we be living in if that works? And for me, that's the legacy that I'm most proud of that we create in our sector. Thank you very much. <laughs>